Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Tracy V. Wilson. And I'm Holly Fry. As we've discussed recently, we went to Barcelona. Sure did. This is uh, the second inspired by uh, by Barcelona episode. The folks that went with us on this trip, man, everybody was just so interesting and gracious and fun to be around. Yeah, it was a magnificent group. This uh, this episode, though, is inspired by a thing that I did when none of those folks were around. It was (laughs) on our free day. In Barcelona, my spouse and I went up to the top of Montjuic, which involved navigating Barcelona's public transportation system by ourselves, taking a funicular railway, and also an aerial cable car. Honestly, the funicular railway and the aerial cable car were each on our list of things we wanted to do, and so it just went out on one thing, one outing. We visited Montjuic Castle, really a fortress dating back to the 17th century. It's now a museum surrounded by lots of paths and green space, and a lot of stuff caught my attention at this museum. One thing being an exhibit that talked about the fort's artillery being used to bombard the city of Barcelona in 1842. And all of the signs in this exhibit were in multiple languages. And if I'm remembering correctly, it was Catalan, Spanish, English, and French so I could read these explanations. But I also really just felt like I was missing something. I would, like, the text assumed that I knew things that I did not already know. And this is not a criticism of these museum signs. I'm sure it also happens to folks who listen to our podcast and are not from the United States when we just, like, name drop something that has been steeped, that we've been steeped in our whole lives that people have not, that live elsewhere. So, turns out, though, this fort-slash-castle has been involved in both the defense of Barcelona and its repression repeatedly over the course of centuries. This 1842 bombardment was one of several launched from the fort. So we're going to talk about the fort's history and these bombardments and how this is also interconnected with the greater history of Catalonia and Spain and Spain's many civil wars. Montjuic is a hill with an elevation of 173 meters, or about 567 feet. It overlooks the Mediterranean Sea and the city of Barcelona, so it's an ideal location for a fort and other defenses. But its name has a different origin, usually cited as one of two possibilities. It may be from Latin words meaning Mountain of Jupiter, coming from a Roman-era settlement there, or it may come from medieval Catalan words meaning Jewish mountain, referencing a Jewish cemetery on the northeast side of the hill that may have been established as early as the 9th century. This isn't the terraced cemetery that you can see on the southeastern slope of Montjuic today. That one opened in 1883. There is not much visible evidence of the Jewish cemetery on the surface of this hill today. Barcelona's Jewish community faced repeated anti-Semitic violence in the 14th century, including a deadly attack on the city's Jewish quarter known as El Cal in 1349, and the Catholic kingdoms of Aragon and Castile also expelled Spain's Jewish population under the Alhambra Decree in 1492. That's something that we have covered on the show before. During and after all of this, people stole a lot of the cemetery's headstones and then used them as building materials. So today, you can see Hebrew inscriptions from some of these grave markers just as part of buildings in Barcelona. Archaeological work also started in this area beginning in the mid-20th century, and that's something that has been controversial because exhuming bodies from their grave sites is generally forbidden under Jewish law. Any exceptions to that are generally focused on honoring the deceased. So this has led to efforts to just protect this cemetery and any remaining grave sites there. Montjuic's use as a settlement and market area probably goes back to at least the 6th or 7th century BCE. A beacon and tower had been built on the hill by the early 11th century CE, one where lookouts could keep watch for incoming enemy ships or armies, or light signal fires that could be seen out at sea and in the surrounding countryside. The fort's beginnings go back to the 17th century during the Catalan Revolt, also known as the Reaper's War. 
For some context on that, going back to about the 12th century, Catalonia had been a principality with its capital in Barcelona, and Catalonia and the Kingdom of Aragon had both been ruled by the same monarch. That started to shift when Ferdinand II of Aragon and Isabella I of Castile got married in 1469. That marriage united multiple kingdoms into a lot of what we now think of as Spain, Although Catalonia retained some of its autonomy, it did not have as much prominence or power as it had before these kingdoms were united, and there were people and movements who wanted Catalonia to be fully independent from the rest of the kingdoms. The Reapers' War started in 1640 during the Franco-Spanish War. It was named for an uprising of Reapers that started on the Feast of Corpus Christi that year. Some of this grew out of economic tensions between the poorer classes and the aristocracy, as well as new taxes to support the military and requirements that people quarter soldiers in their homes. As Catalonia's peasant class rose up against Spanish monarch Philip IV, it sought the protection of Louis XIII of France. During this uprising, the people of Barcelona built a small fort at the top of Montjuic to try to defend the city, and they built this fort over the span of only about 30 days. The Battle of Montjuic took place on January 26, 1641, when a Spanish force tried to capture this newly built fort. But even though this was a pretty basic fortification that had been built very quickly, it was a fort on top of a hill. (laughs) The defensible position. The fort was able to hold off the Spanish troops until Catalan reinforcements arrived. The Franco-Spanish War and the Reapers' War continued for more than a decade, and Philip IV's forces eventually captured Barcelona in 1652. At that point, Spanish forces took control of the fort and from there took over much of Catalonia. The Treaty of the Pyrenees formally ended both of these wars, and under its terms, the parts of Catalonia that lay to the northeast of the Pyrenees came under French control, while the rest of Catalonia was controlled by Spain. The word for reapers is segadors in Catalan, and Catalonia's national anthem, El Segadors, is about the reapers' war. Although France had supported Catalonia's uprising against Spain, During the Nine Years' War, the two were on opposite sides. The Spanish Empire had joined the Grand Alliance that had united to resist French expansionism, and in 1697, French forces besieged and bombarded the city of Barcelona. Then, in 1700, just a few years after the end of the Nine Years' War, Charles II, the last Habsburg monarch of Spain, died without a direct heir. Under the terms of his will, Philip, Duke of Anjou, would become King of Spain. Philip was grandson of King Louis XIV of the House of Bourbon and was in the line of succession for the French throne. So this would put both France and Spain under the control of Bourbon monarchs, and it meant that Philip could potentially become king of both countries. So other nations saw this as a huge threat to the balance of power in Europe. Those nations included Austria, which instead backed Habsburg Archduke Charles of Austria as heir to the Spanish throne. Charles would eventually become Holy Roman Emperor Charles VI, and his claim to the Spanish throne was backed by other nations, including England, Holland, and Prussia. This, of course, led to the War of the Spanish Succession, which is such a big, messy war that I didn't fully realize we were going to have to talk about in this episode. Uh, This involved another multinational grand alliance, which backed the Habsburg claim to the Spanish throne, fighting against Philip and those who were loyal to the Bourbons. By this point, there was a lot of anti-French sentiment in Catalonia, as well as concerns about what would happen to Catalonia under Philip's rule. Catalonia already had less power and autonomy than it did before the Reapers' War, and it seemed likely that Philip would try to further consolidate political power in Madrid and away from Barcelona. It also seemed likely that if Philip won the war, he would punish Catalonia for disloyalty. In spite of that risk, Catalonia backed Charles's claim to the Spanish throne with the hope of preserving its own autonomy. On June 20th, 1705, representatives from Catalonia signed a pact with Queen Anne of England, in which England agreed to provide Catalonia with soldiers, rifles, and ammunition. 
And then under this pact, Catalonia also recognized Charles as the legitimate king of Spain. This pact also specified that Charles would respect the laws and traditions of Catalonia. This was not as simple as Catalonia simply joining the Grand Alliance, though. Catalonia was still considered to be under the control of Spain's central government in Madrid, and in Barcelona, Philip's supporters initially controlled the fort at Montjuic. So Barcelona was once again besieged from mid-September to mid-October of 1705 as the Grand Alliance tried to take control. And it ultimately did. Charles formally entered Barcelona and was recognized as the sovereign of Catalonia on October 22, 1705. Charles's allies captured the fort over the course of 1705 and 1706. This was not at all the end of it, though. Philip got support from France to try to retake Barcelona and the fort, and the fort was nearly destroyed by Philip's allies in 1706. A Grand Alliance fleet arrived with reinforcements in May, taking the fort back and starting rebuilding efforts. When Bourbon troops lay siege to Barcelona again in July of 1713, they focused on the city rather than the fort. Uh, The Duke of Berwick, who was in command of this mission, recognized that trying to attack the fort would come at an enormous cost, like it had been demonstrated very well that it was hard to take a fort that was up on top of the hill in this way. By this point, much of the War of the Spanish Succession was over, and many nations of the Grand Alliance had recognized Philip V as King of Spain under treaty terms that prevented him from also becoming King of France. This included England, although Catalonia had continued to try to secure England's aid and support. Yeah, England didn't really follow through on all of the terms uh, of that pact. Very Fancy thoroughly. that. <laughs> Catalonia continued to support Charles as monarch until September 11, 1714, when the siege of Barcelona finally ended in defeat for Catalonia. Afterward, Catalonia faced brutal repression for both its backing of the Habsburg claim to the throne and having essentially acted like its own independent republic during this war, including signing international treaties without the oversight of Madrid. Philip also stripped Catalonia of its autonomy after this and abolished its constitution. So all of the things they were afraid of. Right. This defeat ultimately led to Catalonia's status as an autonomous community within Spain. And today, September 11th, is observed as the National Day of Catalonia, or the Diada. Yeah, you can read lots of articles about how Catalonia's National Day is observing a military defeat and why that is. Uh, we'll have more after a sponsor break. The fort at Montjuic was badly damaged during the War of the Spanish Succession, and in the decades that followed, architect and military engineer Juan Martín Cermeño renovated, modernized, and expanded it. This was a project that stretched from 1753 to 1779. Then in the 19th century, the fort's armaments were repeatedly used to bombard Barcelona. You may notice we are skipping entirely over the Napoleonic Wars, which Holly talked about (laughs) more in her episode on Barcelona. Uh, I didn't find as much about the fort specifically related to the Napoleonic Wars. I like how our stuff kind of accidentally interlocked together to cover stuff the other one did not. Yeah, These bombardments that Tracy just mentioned of Barcelona began under General Baldomero Espartero, and we need a bit of setup to explain who that was. In 1833, after the death of King Ferdinand VII, Spain once again faced a dispute about who its next monarch should be. Unlike Charles II, Ferdinand did have a direct heir, but that heir was his daughter Isabella II, who was only three years old at the time. In addition to her age, the status of women and girls in the Spanish line of succession was kind of a tangle at this point. During the War of the Spanish Succession, Philip V and the Spanish Parliament had established that a woman could ascend to the Spanish throne only if there were no remaining male heir anywhere in the line of succession. Ferdinand's predecessor, Charles IV, had issued a decision revoking that change in 1789, but that decision had never been implemented. 
So then in 1830, Ferdinand issued a decree known as the Pragmatic Sanction, which promulgated Charles IV's 1789 decision. When Ferdinand did this, he was not well. His wife, Queen Maria Christina de Bourbon, was pregnant. So this decree was absolutely meant to ensure that his child could inherit the throne regardless of that child's sex if he died. Without the pragmatic sanction, Isabella would not have been the next Spanish monarch. Instead, Ferdinand's brother Carlos would have been next in line. And after Ferdinand's death, Carlos proclaimed himself King Carlos or Charles V. Carlos's supporters were known as the Carlists, and overall the Carlists were more conservative and more aligned with the Catholic Church than Queen Maria Cristina, who was acting as Isabella's regent, as well as Isabella's other supporters. Carlos declared war on the newly crowned toddler queen, and that started the first Carlist War, which went on for seven years. There were three of these wars, which were as much about conservatism versus liberalism as they were about Carlos and his descendants' claim to the Spanish throne. The Carlist side had a lot of support in Catalonia and Basque country in particular. The first Carlist War ended in a peace treaty known as the Embrace of Vergara in 1839, and that acknowledged Isabella II as the rightful queen. Just as a note, Bergara is in Basque country, and it's spelled with a B, but references to these historical events and the treaty typically spell it with a V. And a year after this treaty was signed, Isabella's mother resigned from her regency. The reasons don't really have anything to do with the war. Maria Cristina had secretly married a member of the royal bodyguard, a commoner named Augustin Fernando Munoz y Sanchez, and she had children with him. She also faced a mutiny, a revolt, a coup, and an increasing lack of confidence in her abilities during her time as regent. While her marriage and children had been sort of an open secret at court, when it became more publicly known, she was widely condemned, and she eventually went into exile. After her mother stepped down as regent, Isabella's new regent was Baldomero Espartero, Prince de Vergara, general, who had defended the queen and her regent during the First Carlist War. He had also been a key negotiator on the embrace of Vergara. He had been pushing for a number of reforms after returning to Madrid after the end of this war, but while some of those reforms were seen as progressive, they weren't necessarily successful they weren't necessarily things that parts of the population wanted. In particular, his free trade policies led to uprisings in Barcelona because there was a sudden influx of imported goods from Britain, especially textiles. That threatened people's livelihoods. So by 1842, there were anti-Espartero periodicals in Barcelona, and various propaganda lampooning him was being published around the city. Tensions in the city were also high because of economic conflicts. Barcelona was encircled by a wall, with people of all classes overcrowded together inside, and there was a lot of strife between the more affluent people and the working classes. The Carlists had been associated with conservative Catholicism and the clergy, and in part because of this, many monasteries and convents in Barcelona had been burned or otherwise destroyed in 1835. So there were political and religious conflicts as well. And there were lingering after-effects from the War of the Spanish Succession. Broadly speaking, the nobility and clergy had supported the Bourbons, while the common people had supported the Austrian Habsburgs. And no one had really forgotten that. This 1835 destruction of the monasteries was something that our guide, like, just repeatedly almost casually referenced as we were walking through uh, Barcelona on a walking tour. And I kept being like, "What? why was this happening in 1835? Like, that se- it just seemed like an odd time to me to have a sudden destruction of a lot of monasteries and convents and things. Um, it was connected to all of this. A massive popular uprising started in Barcelona on November 13th, 1842. And according to one account, some laborers had taken wine with them to drink with their lunch as they went to work in the fields outside the city walls. November 13th was a Sunday, so there's also a version that it was people who had left the city to go on various outings on their day off, and they had bought wine while they were away, and were they were bringing back what was left over home with them. Uh, Either way, 
people were trying to enter the city at the end of the day, they were ordered to pay a tax on these wine leftovers, which they refused to do. There are also some sources that say it wasn't like this at all, that this was not leftover lunch wine. It was wine that smugglers were trying to sneak into the city. So regardless of that fuzziness, this was the start of a huge popular uprising that was connected to things like taxes and the cost of food. This led to fighting between the national militia and Barcelona's army garrison, with the soldiers eventually retreating to the castle and to the citadel of Barcelona. Hundreds of people were killed in this conflict, and stores were ransacked and looted. A provisional popular court issued demands that Espartero be dismissed and that Catalonian industries be protected and that the queen marry someone Spanish. After about three weeks of this unrest and violence, Espartero arrived in Barcelona and responded to this ongoing crisis by having the city bombarded from the fort. The bombardment started in the middle of the day on December 3rd, 1842, and it continued for 12 hours until a delegation representing the city's residents unconditionally surrendered. More than a 1,000 projectiles were fired from the fort during this bombardment. At least 20 people were killed, and hundreds of buildings were badly damaged. One eyewitness wrote that after the bombardment, quote, the city had taken on a sepulchral aspect. Doors and shops closed, the streets almost deserted, in some places obstructed by the ruins and rubble of devastated houses and shrouded by the smoke coming from the many still-burning buildings. Espartero was quoted as saying, quote, for the good of Spain, Barcelona must be bombarded once every 50 years. In the wake of the uprising, 13 people were tried and sentenced to death, and another 80 were imprisoned. Less than a year later, another uprising started in Barcelona, this one known as La Jamencia. This name came from a word for food, was probably a disparaging reference to people who joined volunteer battalions in order to get free meals. And there was a lot going on with this uprising. Some of Spain's generals had found Espartero's bombardment of Barcelona to be really an appalling act. And so the military's more liberal and moderate factions had banded together to try to unseat him as regent. These factions were led by General Ramon Maria Navarrez de Campos, and some of his supporters had backed him because of reforms they expected him to bring. When those reforms didn't arrive right away, he lost their support. This was also an uprising against the government of Spanish Prime Minister Joaquin Maria Lopez and an anti-aristocratic uprising that was calling for fairer distribution of wealth. There were just a lot of factors going on with this. The response to this uprising involved another bombardment of the city of Barcelona from the fort at Montjuic, this time one that lasted for two months. There were 335 deaths and hundreds of serious injuries, and at least 40,000 people fled the city. In the wake of all this, Baldomero Espartero was ousted as regent, and Isabella II, now 13 years old, was declared legally of age to rule. She assumed the throne of Spain directly on November 10, 1843. And there was still one more major bombardment of Barcelona from the fort at Montjuic in the 19th century. Baldomero Espartero had left Spain after being ousted as regent, but eventually returned. And in 1854, he and General Leopoldo O'Donnell were jointly put in charge of the government in what was described as the Bienio Progresista, or the Progressive Biennium. This was intended to be a period of progressive reform, but in July of 1846, O'Donnell displaced Espartero, something that some sources describe as a coup. The people of Barcelona rose up against this change in power and were once again bombarded from the fort. Isabella II was driven into exile after an uprising in 1868, and she abdicated the throne in 1870. During her reign, she had weathered another Carlist war, and a third followed after she had been deposed. In 1874, during the Third Carlist War, her oldest surviving son was declared King Alfonso XII. We'll talk about the history of this fort later in the 19th century and into the 20th after a sponsor break. (laughs) 
In the late 19th century, the Fort de Montjuic was largely used as a prison, particularly for radicals, revolutionaries, and anarchists. This had some similarities to the first Red Scare in the United States, which we've talked about on the show before. Authorities in Spain responded to anarchist attacks and bombings with mass arrests and imprisonments, and there were demonstrations in the city of Barcelona as people learned that prisoners being held at the fort were also being tortured and executed. But a key difference between what was happening in Barcelona and what would happen in the U.S. a couple of decades later is that the labor movement in Catalonia was deeply rooted in anarcho-syndicalism. That's a branch of anarchism that's focused on trade unionism and on working-class direct action meant to dismantle capitalism and the wage system entirely and establish a new society that's democratically managed by workers themselves. During this period, the Barcelona City Council, understanding that atrocities were happening at the fort, argued that the fort at Montjuic should be ceded to the city so that it could be totally dismantled or maybe turned into an anti-war museum. The fort also played a part in the events that led up to the Spanish Civil War and the war itself. This, once again, requires us to back up a little. We've already talked about so many wars and coups that took place in Spain over the 18th and 19th centuries, and things became even more divided in the early 20th century. There was a whole series of attempted military coups and multiple assassination attempts against King Alfonso XIII, son of Alfonso XII, and his wife, Queen Victoria Eugenie of Battenberg. In 1923, Miguel Primo de Rivera was made prime minister of Spain after one of these many military coups. He ran Spain essentially as a dictator. And at this point, two different factions had been advocating for Catalonian autonomy or even full independence from Spain for decades. And these two factions had very different points of view. One was primarily conservative and Catholic, and it included a lot of people who had backed the Carlist side in the Carlist Wars. Once the last of the Carlist Wars had ended, a lot of Carlists in Catalonia had gone from supporting one of Carlos's descendants as monarch of Spain to instead supporting Catalonian independence. The other faction was really largely secular and left-leaning, and it included a lot of socialists and anarchists and anarcho-syndicalists. Catalonia had been given a degree of autonomy in 1913, but Primo de Rivera repealed that legislation in 1925. He was campaigning for national unity under the slogan, Country, Religion, Monarchy, and his idea of unity did not include any possibility for any Catalonian autonomy. Primo de Rivera's actions toward Catalonia led its more left-wing factions to form a coalition party called Esquerra Republicana. This coalition won a majority in a 1931 election, and soon afterward, the Generalitat de Catalunya, or Government of Catalonia, declared Catalonia a republic. King Alfonso XIII was forced to leave Spain that same year, although he did not formally abdicate his throne. This started the period known as the Second Spanish Republic, and faced with the possibility of Catalonia declaring itself fully independent, the new central government in Madrid negotiated a compromise. Legislation that granted some autonomy to Catalonia, but not independence, was passed in September of 1932. Initially, the newly formed Republican government in Madrid had tried to pass pretty overall progressive reforms, and conservatives, Catholics, and the military objected to a lot of these reforms. Then in 1933, a coalition of right-wing political factions called the Spanish Confederation of Autonomous Rights attained a majority in the Spanish government. When the newly elected representatives took office, they started rolling back those reforms, and then beyond that, a lot of people on the left in Spain regarded the Spanish Confederation of Autonomous Rights as fascist. After the newly formed Spanish government came into power in 1934, socialists, unionists, anti-fascist groups, anarcho-syndicalists, and others on the left started a wave of general strikes and uprisings. This is sometimes called the Revolution of 1934 or the October Revolution of 1934. 
In Catalonia, President Luis Campaños proclaimed the Catalan state within the Spanish Republic on October 6, 1934, saying that monarchs and fascists had attacked the Spanish government. In response, Spanish military authorities declared martial law, and soon Campaños was arrested. The statute that had granted Catalonian autonomy was suspended, and Campaños was imprisoned until 1936. Also in 1936, the Spanish government's political alignment shifted once again, with the liberal Popular Front winning a majority in parliament. The Popular Front was concerned about the spread of nationalism within Spain's military and started removing people who were suspected of conspiring against the Spanish government. Some of these were very high-ranking officers who had generally backed the conservative National Front. One of these officers was Francisco Franco. Franco eventually joined a group of military leaders who launched a coup in July of 1936. And in Barcelona, the coup involved most of the Spanish army officers who were stationed there. But then the Civil Guard and other law enforcement in Barcelona fought back against the military, along with civilians and anarcho-syndicalist militias. So the Spanish army's attempt to take over Barcelona was unsuccessful. And for a few months after this, the anarcho-syndicalist militia were more numerous and better armed than the regular law enforcement in Barcelona, and they essentially had control of the city. This coup became the start of the Spanish Civil War, which was, broadly speaking, again, between the Nationalists and the Republicans. The Nationalists were more conservative, more likely to be Catholic and affluent, while the Republicans, also known as Loyalists, included more middle-class people, laborers, communists, and other leftists. The Third Carlist War had ended decades before this, but a lot of former Carlists were on the Nationalists' side. There were, certainly, people in Catalonia and Barcelona who supported Franco and the nationalist side. But as a region, Catalonia was loyal to the Second Spanish Republic and its elected government. A lot of the international news coverage at the beginning of the war was about Barcelona, and many of the volunteers who joined the international brigades from elsewhere in the world to fight on the Republican side were inspired by dispatches from Barcelona. George Orwell traveled to Spain and joined a militia, and his memoir, Homage to Catalonia, detailed his training in Barcelona and his experiences elsewhere in the war. On August 23, 1936, Catalonia's Committee of Anti-Fascist Militias took control of the fort at Monjuic and used it as a recruitment center and a place to imprison and try political prisoners. Republicans in Barcelona cracked down on nationalists and members of the Falange political party, which had become the official nationalist party in 1937. Between 1936 and 1938, 173 people were executed at the fort. Leftists in Barcelona also took over theaters, clubs, and homes belonging to people and organizations that were believed to be aligned with Franco or complicit in fascism. There were also some really deep divisions within the Republican side in Barcelona. That led to a series of violent clashes known as the Barcelona May Days in 1937. By the end of the war, Catalonia was the last remaining Republican stronghold in Spain, aside from Madrid. Franco's troops finally seized Barcelona on January 26, 1939, and afterward also took control of the fort at Montjuic. From there, the nationalists took the rest of Catalonia. This was an enormous loss for the Republican side in terms of both troop casualties and Catalonia's industrial resources. Madrid fell a couple of months later. This was a truly, truly horrifying war that involved a long series of mass atrocities. At least 500,000 people died during the war itself, And afterward, Franco's regime executed an estimated 100,000 Republican prisoners. After the war ended, Franco ruled Spain as a dictator. He stripped Catalonia of all remaining political autonomy and banned hallmarks of Catalonian heritage and independence, including banning the Catalan language. During the Franco era, Montjuic Castle was still used as a prison and a place to hold trials for political dissidents but this time for people who opposed Francisco Franco and his government. 
1940, exiled president of Catalonia, Luis Campanos, was arrested in France and transferred to Barcelona at the request of Franco's government. On October 14, 1940, he faced a summary court-martial at Montjuic Castle and was sentenced to death. Campanus was executed by firing squad at the fort on the following day. In 1960, the fort at Montjuic was partially ceded to the city of Barcelona, although it still retained some military functions, and Francisco Franco established a military museum there in 1963. After Franco's death in 1975, Spain became a democracy, and Catalonia was recognized as an autonomous community with Catalan recognized as an official language. The Catalan government declared the castle a cultural asset of national interest in 1988. In 2007, the castle was fully ceded to the Barcelona City Council, and it became property of the people of Barcelona. The military museum was ordered to be closed that year. It stopped operation in 2009, with the last of its collection transferred to other institutions. We've really only talked about the fort, but the fort is obviously not the only thing located on Montjuic. Among other things, it was the site of the World Expo in 1929 and the 1992 Summer Olympic Games in Barcelona. There are a lot of sports facilities up there, including a stadium named for Luis Campanas and other museums besides the one that's housed in the castle now. A lot of the archaeological finds that have been unearthed on Montjuic were found during the preparations and construction for the World Expo and the Olympic Games. There's still an ongoing Catalan independence movement. A 2017 independence referendum made headlines around the world and was declared illegal by Spain's constitutional court. The referendum itself was also contentious. The votes that were cast were overwhelmingly in favor of independence, but the turnout was low, in part because many unionists boycotted the vote. At that point, separatists held a majority in the Catalonian parliament and voted for full independence, prompting the central Spanish government in Madrid to dissolve the Catalonian parliament and call for new elections. All of this happened in the midst of widespread demonstrations and unrest and a police crackdown on demonstrators. More recently, pro-independence parties won more than half the vote in the 2021 regional elections. As a total outsider to this, I feel like things have been quieter on this front than in 2017 uh, when the yeah. when the referendum happened. Um, that again, that's based on my ignorant American (laughs) perception of international news and who knows what will happen, uh, you know, immediately after we record this episode based on our previous track record. Right. I feel like while we were there in Barcelona, our wonderful tour guide, I, I, to this moment, do not know if she was trying to downplay it to make everything palatable to tourists or if this is just the vibe and, like, mm-hmm. it's hard for us to grasp. Because, like, at one point we had walked by, uh, like, an apartment building where people had flags out that were still protesting and, like, you know, calling for independence. And she's like, oh, you know, people are allowed to voice their ideologies here. And and everyone just knows that, you know, we listen to each other. And I'm like... Wait, hmm. is this just yeah. an undercurrent of yeah. conflict that you're so used to, you've learned to work around it? Or are you just making this very simplified and not scary to people that are yeah. missing? <laughs> in, in terms of what I personally witnessed while we were in Barcelona, I saw signs related to homes that will have to be destroyed if Sagrada Familia is completed according to its current plan. Right. Um, Like, there are people who would be displaced from their homes and their homes would be destroyed, like, if those plans are followed. So I saw banners and signs and things about that. Um, And I also saw, uh, we were in Barcelona. I don't, this is an ongoing thing, so it's not something we can say whether this was really early or not. But, like, the Israel-Hamas war uh, was happening while we were there. Um, And at one point, I did see a, like, a pro-Palestinian demonstration um, nearby to where we were. Um, And, like, those were two things that were more obvious to me while we were there than things related to independence. 
or autonomy or independence, really, I guess would be the more. Yeah, I would agree. There were other issues that were way more at the forefront when we would see any political or, um, you know, socially oriented signage, like that Sagrada Familia thing, which is a tricky one, right? Because that space where those apartments are was supposed to never be built on, and then it was. And now it's where people live. Yeah. And in some cases, like, people have been living there for years and years. Right, because Sagrada Familia has taken literally more than 100 years. Right, yeah. Um, So I can understand where there was a moment of, we cannot wait forever, we need more space for people in the city. Yeah. We got to build here. That one's so tricky to envision, like, how that can play out in a way that is, I don't, peaceful is not the right word, but that is acceptable and doesn't ruin anyone's life. Right, yeah. Yeah. Um, So anyway, that was just our perception as non-local people visiting Barcelona in whatever month we were there. Was it October? It's November. (laughs) November. (laughs) Time has blurred. It's bad. Uh, Speaking of time, I have listener mail. (laughs) Listener mail is from Andrew. Andrew wrote, and uh, the title of his email is Thursday Next and the Rebecca Riots. And Andrew wrote, Tracy and Holly, I got a real kick out of the episode about the Rebecca Riots. I just finished rereading Jasper Ford's The Air Affair and was wondering why in the book. The People's Republic of Wales was founded in 1839 with the capital, the town of Merthyr Tidville. When I heard both mentioned in your episode, I was quite tickled. Oh, and thanks for the Tlingit book news from the same episode. I have some family friends who are Tlingit, and I know uh, they would be tickled to know that such a book exists. Just dropping you a note to say how much I enjoy the show, Andrew. Thanks so much for this note, Andrew. I read The Air Affair many years ago. I remember its basic conceit, but no details. And so I had no recollection at all that uh, in the world of The Air Affair... Wales is its own republic, and its capital is in Merthyr Tidville. And um, I feel like that has a an un, an accidental tangential relationship to what we have been talking about in this episode in terms of uh, autonomy and independence for places that are considered part of another nation. So anyway, thanks so much, Andrew, for sending this note. If you would like to send us a note about this or any other podcast, we're at historypodcast at iheartradio.com. We're on social media at Missed in History, and you can subscribe to our show on the iHeartRadio app and wherever else you like to listen to podcasts. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. <laughs> 